and Gemma, welcome back to New York City. The sun has set many hours ago now, actually. We're fast approaching midnight local time here in New York. But if we thought we'd been here for a long time, uh, thank you for staying tuned in with us wherever you are in the world right now. It's the uh, middle of the morning. It's gone all the way through the night over in Europe right now. And I uh, know all of our crowd here. Thank you for coming down and cheering on for your favorite teams and enjoying Dota 2. It's been fantastic to have you here at Madison Square Garden Theatre. We have potentially one more game left, maybe even two. What do the panel think, though, after that first... Um, I, it, this is probably an English phrase. Um, Perian Flax would probably help me out. That was a bit of a drubbing. Was a drubbing. Yeah, it was yeah. a drubbing, it wasn't was it? was a proper old-fashioned, over rubbing? the knee drubbing. What is that, like camel drop? What? <laughs> camel? What? <laughs> what do you mean, dropping? I mean, it's like a whip. A beating. Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a bit of a, a beating. Uh-huh, yeah. uh-huh. Uh, but we are in to uh, draft uh, mode already, uh, thankfully. And uh, two picks on the board and two bands on the board already from both. And a uh, mm, little bit of a change up this Cloud time around for Cloud9. Mirana Rebane and uh, Razor and Skyrath coming out for SNA. I mean, just to Quickly recap. summarize game one. I think yeah, it was just a matter of on skill one. level, right? I think uh, Cloud9 definitely showed that they are the better individual mm. yeah. team. Yeah, because you know we all agree, or well, you guys all agree, that bef when we came out of draft, actually, we were like, mm, well, actually, th remaining. that's a pretty good draft for, for Sneaky. They, they, you know, they've got the better draft out of this. So why did it go wrong? Was it just down to individual skill, team play? What they didn't it? anticipate the lanes very well, and they just didn't, they didn't do that much. They didn't secure Spectre's farm very well. They didn't protect Death Prophet. And if you can't get those with... Uh, Cloud9's greedy lineup, you're not going to win later just because Spectre has too much catch up to do. So they just have to concentrate a little bit more on lanes and get more out of their supports. I feel like Whitebeard uh, missed a few opportunities that other players or teams may have capitalized a bit more on. He's no no-till. I also think there were quite a few times when it looked like they were not just caught out of position, but didn't react anywhere nearly quickly enough to the threat. So you'd see someone just sort of stood there, and then they'd sort of start to turn, and they'd, by that point they'd be dead. Like people would just—they were just getting jumped on over and over again. I didn't think they had the awareness. So how, how should they tackle Cloud9 in this game then? Um, I don't know if you maybe just go for safer heroes, that it's like much harder I thought, to... I thought last game was pretty I, safe. Yeah, I agree. But I mean, <laughs> even safer maybe? I don't know. It's TC different. on Razor. He's pretty That's safe on Razor. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it's very difficult. I mean, you've got a Bane Marana coming at you now, so... That, you know, they're not going to be able to rest at any point. It's going to be very hard for them. Uh, all in laning a combo again. I mean, Ben Mirana is so hard to face. There is, I don't, I can't think of one off laner that can actually do well. Nature's Prophet is okay. Nature's Prophet is okay if the Bane Mirana just sticks to the sleep into arrow, but if you're just gonna run on Nature's Prophet, just sleep, leap on him and just damage, you know, damage him with Starfall, he just dies, you know. Th that combo is very, very scary. I don't think there is one hero that can actually win or do decent. One Bristleback may He just dies level one, honestly. Yeah. Bane just forces him out, and whenever Bristleback actually has yeah. to go like behind the creep wave, just sleep into arrow dead. Cloud Bounty nine. Hunter and hope they don't buy wards. Oh yeah, that, that will work. <laughs> just, uh, just a quick thing on, uh, okay. on Morphling. Um, mentioned for Eternal Envy in that first game, because <laughs> he was on a roll pretty much the whole way through the game. That's nine. one of his best yeah. heroes. 20.5k uh, gold at 30 minutes, no problem at all. Just steamrolling everyone in his wake. It seemed like he was having a ball. Well, they banned that one out. But he plays so many different heroes. I don't really think you can ban against EE e except the Terror Blade because he's slightly stronger than most of the other ones, but most of the other ones are just interchangeable. I also don't feel it was the heroes necessarily. Yes. Like, it's not like you could tell if we ban the Morphling now, we've got them. Yep. Like, they need to really Ten yeah, I mean, that's, something that's, special. You're right, and I you think that's obvious so by the fact that it's, it's, shouldn't have happened. it's fourth ban. I mean, if they were really worried about it, it would have been first ban, wouldn't it? So, See, there you go, Wraith King, hard to kill, nice safe hero, easy peasy. <laughs> <laughs> You're uh, onto something. What, yeah. what, do we, what do we think of the cloud? No, no, Mirana, Bane, Void, and Puck. They just want to win lanes. I don't want to play against any of them. Yeah. Yep, so. I was thinking the same. It's funny that they actually ch choose the Puck because it might be a Razor mid, so it, uh, like many drafters actually Ten try to look for an option versus that Razor, right? Because Razor is very strong. We've seen Team Secret actually draft Five the Shaker, seconds. the roaming Shaker, and be like, I'm just going to put something that's going to harass the Razor all the time with a DP. Or it was, I'm not sure about the first hero anyway. And then we just kill him whenever the Shaker is in range of a Fisher. Uh, Buck might be one of those heroes. I think any 600 range um, mid laner is actually, does actually decently with his Razor. 
if the bug is actually aware of what's going on, if you want to get boots or if you get boots quite fast, then the link is not as effective. I could see Fada going even versus the Razor in one on one mid. I've seen Quap do pretty Reserve decently time. versus Razors. I think Quap is a very good hero to get versus the Razor. Yeah, I'm surprised she hasn't been picked up yet at all. But she's very situational later on. Gyrath owns Puck for the most part. That's for sure. But um, yes, Nas line up a little bit more early game-ish, doesn't require as much coordination, at least maybe not to the extent as AA and Spectre. So easier to execute, the more centaur. wiggle room. Yeah. The Centaur, centaur is, is going to have a really tough time. What do you think the last pickup here is for either side? I mean, I, I think Purion is really, really onto something here. Enigma, wow. Enigma really? for Cloud9, in my opinion. <laughs> like the Razor, the Wraith King, <laughs> the, the <laughs> Sensor, I'm so Warrunner. surprised there. <laughs> I, I honestly think if you've, you know, if you've, if you've, if in the previous game you felt, and I think that they would feel the same thing, that they did get whipping, get a whipping, then um, you, if you fall back to a nice safe strat, like you said, an easy one to execute. Viper? Yeah, good Viper, he's there, you know, it, it just be at least hard to kill. Um, Abaddon. Be in the game, yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of heroes they could pick. As Cloud9, I would get an Enigma last pick, and as SNA and OG, but that, that's just me. I think Odi can crush the puck, and he's actually quite good with the heroes they have. You'd want an Enigma into that lineup, into yeah. the Cloud9 lineup? I think it's Maybe great, because their safe is going to be really strong no matter what. You I can afford a greedy Enigma pick, and it, like, the Midnight Pulse with the Void. I mean, Enigma Void is such a great combo oh, to I have. thought you were saying that, that uh, Sneaky Nick no, 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 should no. pick Enigma, because no, no, I'm thinking there's like a ton of ways for him to get Okay, no, no, I can't. <laughs> No, no, no. Like, yeah. I mean, for Cloud9. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Also, he fits with the color scheme that Definitely. they get for the blue purple. That's very important. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah Not definitely. to be underestimated. Reserve time. So you think DE is playing the Mirana? Um, yeah, he might be. I think it's a good hero for him right now. Because I was thinking the, the two supports might just take up the, the Bane and Mirana and just yeah. roam around and really just completely ruins Snaz's day. Yeah. It is a good way to deal with the Razor, and also I, I think the two supports, if that's a scatter thinking support, are going to be roaming for SNA as well. So that might be a good answer, actually. I still think like, I mean, a Mirana position one is actually good versus the heroes. I think they could just roam with her and they'll pick up enough kills that she'll just sort of get farmed that way, mm -hmm. farm heroes. Ten seconds it's, remaining. it's really open right now. I still favor the ending pick, but... So, Ted, what would you pick if you were if Cloud9 too? Cloud9? Yeah. Um, well, let's assume we're going to put, like... You'd well, there you go, Witch Doctor. I would, because I can play him, and he's purple, and he fits with the color scheme, so... Um, I mean, he synergizes very well with Void and Puck, um, so his ult is disgusting. He's an awesome hero in every way. Um, and I think that if you want to talk about roaming around, Witch Doctor Bane Marana could even go on a little magical journey somewhere. You, you um, generally have a lot of animosity against a lot of the, the spells in the game. Who, me? Yeah, heroes yeah, and do. spells that are disgusting and gross. He is awesome. <laughs> well, yeah, it's just, yeah. He, but he's awesome. I mean, I, I love Witch Doctor. But his combo is gross. With, with Faceless Void. <laughs> All right. It's nicely balanced there, anyway. Last pick. I like Pugna for... Uh, I haven't seen a Pugna today. He'd get, he'd get whipped. Yeah, I just go the Pyrian strat and just go Tide Hunter and. Nice and safe. Tide's banned. Tide's out already. Oh, okay. There you go, SK. Awesome. Oh. So I did not see that coming. That's either. Skeleton King farming Skeleton King, right? Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're uh, ready for uh, game number two in our fourth quarter final. Cloud9 taking on Sneaky Nix Assassins. The Sneaky Boys need to win this one if they're going to stay in ESL1. New York. Otherwise, Cloud9 will move on to the semi-finals. Let's go back to the commentary desk. That's right, we're back now for game number two. Cinderin and I are going to be casting this. And what do you think, Cinderin? The Cloud9, the purple draft here, is it good enough to face up against Sneaky Nix Assassins, who are running a lot of aggression here? And I like to see that. I think that really plays into Sneaky Nix's Assassin's strength. I think they're a great, great team in the first 35 minutes of the game. Um, I think that's really the if they, they have to play aggressive, man. I don't think falling back into the late game is really their style so much. No, and you don't want to play late game against Cloud9 unless you really have a good late game strategy. They're a team that is has absolutely no problem with taking games past the hour, have no problem with farming a lot if that's what it takes, and just controlling the map, playing a map control kind of style, and, and just draining you of resources. And I would say in this game, 
for me, the biggest thing for Nyx is that they, they have better supports this time for early aggression. So I'm, I'm looking for Whitebeard and, and Fluff to make rotations early on with the Sanking Skywrath. They've got a lot of burst damage, a good reliable stun, and maybe most importantly, they've got good lanes to gank for. They have a safe lane Wraith King, they have an off lane Centaur, and they have a mid lane Razor, all of which have good synergy with oh, the other heroes. Actually, on. look Arrow. for an opening. It's going to be able to hit Whitebeard. It's Cloud9 are backing themselves up. Ike's Mike is looking for anybody to be able to stomp. The cast goes off, bouncing around a little bit, and it doesn't look like Ike Ike's Mike is going to be able to get close enough for anybody for the stomp as just barely outside of range of some of those supports. In fact, he could be in some trouble here. They're going to bounce the sleep around, will protect Fluff and stuff as well as the secondary arrow. arrow comes out. And well, they're a little bit battered and bruised, but Cloud9 will walk away successfully and Sneaky Nix's ass is actually going to have to burn through quite a bit of regen there as the four different ranged heroes really put a beating on them. Yeah, so what we, what we talked about for, for Sneaky Nicks having better early aggressive heroes is great, but I also want to say I think Cloud9's draft is really, really good. It's, it's proven to be a solid draft playing at this, this, uh, with this combination of heroes. It is a purple strat, I guess it's fair to say, purple or bluish. And the thing that's very nice about this is that they've got, they've got good lanes, they've got excellent team fighting, and something I uh, was talking about earlier today, they've got multiple ways, means of initiation, which I think is really great. You can set up a fight with an arrow, if you hit that, you can start the fight, you can start the fight with the Blink Dream Coil, you can start the fight with a Chronosphere, and no matter how you start it, you've got great follow-up. Actually, IX Mike is gonna get a little bit chased down here by Owie, who's going to town with that haste rune, but can't really get the job done completely, but... Yeah, that is not a great start to your offlane. When you get there, you've already had to burn through over half of your region like this. Uh, Ike's Mike is not going to be a happy camper. Bottom lane, though, they are going to be able to jump on Bone7 here. The sleep onto us will prevent any extra damage from him, but it looks like Bone7 with that level one arrow is easily first caught blood. out. First Blood is actually going to be picked up by oh, Owie in the top lane. Yeah. Still, though, we will be seeing this kill in the bottom lane, so at least they get some vengeance, but still, Ike's Mike being a little bit too aggressive in this top lane lane and ends up getting caught and feeding away that first blood before Sneaky Nick's assassins can lay claim to it. That's a really big blow for them because that, that first blood was one they definitely thought they had in the bag. They knew Mirana was level one and had already used the arrow. She was completely dead. There was no doubt about it. No possible escape there for Bone7, but he just bought as much time as he could and, and secured the first blood for their, for his own team in the top lane. Now he's going to take that and that's going to be Ooh, early bottom. for the Witch Dog. Hi. Oh, nice bro strike. Still gets hit by the arrow, but it looks like that may be enough. Pylai Dive will be falling there. And Sneaky Nyx Assassins pull out another one. Let's check on Ike's Mike, though. Make sure he's not going to be dying as uh, don't want to be jinxed in that again. He's fighting up against Aoi's constant harassment, but he should be fine. I'm not sure exactly how he overextended himself. As it feels like the face is void, especially at level one. Uh, it seems like it's damage oh, you should expect. Oh, they're going for him again. Oh, God. Like it's happening again here. The stomp goes off. EE, he, is he needs a time lock. One last right click. They get off a little bit of potion heal. Eternal Envy really gunning for this one, and one big right click is all it takes to take him down. Eternal Envy will be able to get himself out of range of this tower in time, and even going to be able to pick up a bounty rune for his efforts. Ix Mike is just completely destroyed in this game. First he went up to his lane with half region, then he died. Then he bought a salve and two, another pack of tangos, then he died again. So he's now in the off lane with zero oh, look CS, at this. two deaths. Bone 7, and he's going to be silenced up, and he's taken down as well. This bottom lane, oh, that's a beautiful sleep. The jump away, the leap, Ush, he doesn't have enough mana. They actually were unable to take him down. Bone Real. 7 lived with just three different health. That is ridiculous. And now Pylai Die is going to be left alone in this matchup up against the tri lane. That invis should have easily secured a kill for them, but unfortunately, a really great sleep there from Pylai Die was able to save his ally. At the same time in the mid lane, Puck is actually, this is the only lane we haven't really talked much about just yet, but Puck is playing up evenly with Razor, which I think is is really good on the Puck. I I would say Razor usually wins this lane by just going into Static Link and just putting, just walking into the Puck, draining the damage, and Puck has to either oh, run away or walk out. But. He's taken down in this bottom lane. There's nothing he can do to stop this. A couple of right clicks, and that's all it takes. The supports are away. No well, the supports are away. Bone 7 teleports in. They get a sleep arrow combination that finishes them off. That's such a big kill, too. When they manage to take down the safe lane carry with their two offlaners, they're now level four on the Mirana, and the Bane is level three, too. So now, these two heroes combined for Cloud9 can actually pretty much two-man almost any hero on the Radiant right now. Oh, wait a second. Oh, bone seven. seven. Yep, he's going to be stunned up. The silence is going to come through as well, and maybe enough right clicks. He still has a leap up. Arrow goes out, fluff and stuff. Starstorm goes out and oh. almost able to finish him off. Three health there. And the three health, man, what is it about that number? <laughs> These heroes surviving with just 
slivers of HP. Still, though, I, I have to say, the bottom lane, at least they got a kill there. But all this early aggression, the one really bad thing is that Sand King is kind of renowned as being a hero that is able to really utilize the jungle much, much better due to the Sandstorm, the increased efficiency you're able to get from that. And because of the fact they're spending so much time being aggressive and it's failing, the Sand King is really falling behind quite heavily due to the fact he's not going to oh, be picking up. got stomped. Oh, he no. Oh, no, the blast reveals it's going to be able to get him TC low enough, and they will be able to get the brain set to finish him off. Ix Mike will be able to get himself away. What is Bone Seven? Oh, is he really going to gun for this one? He's going to go through into the middle lane, sees Fluff and stuff, and will quickly back himself up with that haste rune. And Ix Mike will try and return back to his lane here with just one tango left. Oh, he's actually going to be able to see him. And they do know he's up here at the very least, but it seems like, uh, Mike, it might be a risky maneuver Radiant for him to stay up here with so little reach, and he's hiding himself in the side. Oh, he does see him. Eternal Envy is ready with the leap. It's going to be able to go on him, but at the same time, Fluff and stuff is here. Maybe the slow can help him out. Ike's Mike, he gives in to his own death. He just double edges the faces void to throw out as much damage as possible and embraces the death that awaits him. He's just Radiant totally out of this game. This is yeah. by far the most stomped we've seen an, uh, an offlaner be, uh, get in this tournament so far. Has absolutely Radiant nothing. 250 Radiant gold, he's got three deaths, zero CS in a five minute game on the Radiant offlane. He has absolutely no presence. The Stampede is miles away right now. And because of that, I mean, it's, it's good enough for... Top tower you know, Nyx Assassin's kind of got a, an even trade in the bottom lane, which is a three on two lane. They got crushed in the top lane. It's, it's just not good enough, right? They, they're once again off to a very weak start in the laning stage. It's a 2k gold lead for Cloud9 in a five minute game in which, you know, this should, just on paper, the way the lanes were put, it should have been even at the very least. Uh, that, that bottom lane, they need to win three on two. The Centaur should be able to get at least something against the Witch Doctor Void lane, which, to be honest, isn't that strong. But that level one fight and the way Ike's Mike got caught out by the haste from the start just crippled him and ruined his entire game. And then continuing to die twice top. I don't know, he, he needs to find another place to go. This is just, just won't work. Yeah, and unfortunately, Centaur is one of those heroes who really can't make a much of a recovery anywhere else in the map. I mean, you can try and jungle, but it's oftentimes very, very slow, and you really rely on Tranquil Boots, which obviously Ike's Mike is just leagues and leagues away from that one. At the very least, TC seems to be doing pretty well in this mid lane, but of course, it is a matchup that I, I agree with you, Cinderin. It, it's a matchup that probably should play slightly into the favor of the Razor, just being able to constantly static link. Now, though, that we're getting into the level 6, level 7 area, Beta is able to set up easy rotations for his supports by leading with that dream coil and all the burst damage he's able to lay in. So it's something that Razor really has to, to uh, take into account as he knows he's probably going to have a target on his back due to the fact that he's farming up so well and the rest of his team is doing so poorly. Yeah, I, I wouldn't be surprised to see Cloud9 going for the mid as the next target. They they also want to give Fata a comeback, and it's exactly what's happening right now. The coil is off, goes for the silence in the orb as well. It's actually Eternal Envy they're going to port into this with the Chronosphere. Do they have the damage? The arrow's going to be able to come out, actually hits the creep, and TC will survive. In fact, they get the stun at Eternal Envy. TC, living with just a sliver of help, but the last hit will be able to finish him off, and now Feta has to make the jump away. He will do so successfully. Still, though, a one for two exchange, including the big carry there for Cloud nine a uh, big win for them that went all kinds of wrong for cloud nine i think fata initiated too early while the tps were still coming in he could have waited another second or a second and a half then the arrow missed because of a creep inside the chronosphere and even the order in which the heroes came in just seemed it seemed a little bit of an odd gank here for cloud nine they get to pay for a great response from nix to uh, to get a couple of kills there and Mike was there. I think that's important. He got a kill on the Centaur. So he's now level 5 and has Tranquil Boots all of a sudden. So that one gank that Cloud9 attempted actually gave Mike a comeback in the game, which is not what they were looking for. Yeah, and as soon as he hits that level 6, that means so much for not only your potential aggression for the Centaur, but also the rest of the map, right? Those potential ganks could be upset by the fact that extra a bit of movement speed from the ultimate can make a big difference in either getting away from a potential death or maybe claiming a kill in one of these side lanes. So, uh, Feta being able to grab himself a regen rune. Pretty much the best rune you can get as a puck at this point in time. Meanwhile, our Wraith King, Ush, is doing a pretty good job farming up. He's currently sitting at 37 and 17. Not quite as good as uh, Eternal Envy. Arrow actually snags him. Of course, he's got a reincarnation, and there's just simply not enough damage from Cloud9 to be able to get that kill. But they are kind of weakening 
him up a little bit for a potential dive where if they can just claim the reincarnation, it's almost as good as a kill solely because of the fact that that really, really long cooldown on the level one ultimate uh, really cripples the Wraith King for the next three or four minutes. Yeah, and the, the timing on that is also going to be that uh, Pilot I will be level six for the next time reincarnation comes up and then maybe they can kill him by draining out his mana as well. Right. So they, They're definitely looking to put on the aggression here. The mid lane gank... I was about to say it was successful. It wasn't, but at least the Razor did die when they went for it. But because of that, maybe they're putting... Well, there goes the ultimate. Lanes, but bottom lane... They're going to go for Pylai die here. He the one so stun. And very, very dead indeed. The arrow at least oh, lands yeah, on Fluff Mark and stuff. Veda comes in. Dream is going to be able to get one. Holds in Whitebeard. And with the dust going out, never mind. I think we're calling it way too early, Cinderin. That is easily a great team fight for Cloud9 as they not only save Pi's life, but get two kills in return. Both the supports yeah, die for their smoke rotation. That that counter arrow from Bone 7 completely salvaged the situation. If that one yeah. doesn't come in, and if it hits anyone else than the Skyrath, I think it's an it's easily a, a dead target on Cloud9. The Bane would have would have died there for sure. Just getting silenced by the Skyrath and then nuked twice, he would have gone down. But he hits the arrow on the right target at the right time, and Cloud9 reinforce very quickly. So they get two kills and a tier one tower for this. Easily the biggest exchange in the game so far going in their favor. Oh, Pi, he's going to be caught out here as the double edge will be able to finish him off. The tower is going into deny range. Bone7 wants to commit to it. He will be off. Whitebeard trying to catch up. Oh, the silence. It goes off just a bit too late, and Bone7, when he is able to leap away, has more than enough distance to get away from the pursuit of SNA. And with this tier one falling and internal envy still just free farming in the top lead, they've managed to accumulate a 4,000 gold lead at this point. The experience is fairly even, which is, of course, I think Nick should be satisfied with considering how, how poorly their offlane went in the start. Now the challenge for them is getting Blink Daggers. I think that's when their lineup starts to really come online. When Ix Mike gets a Blink Dagger, when they get a Blink Dagger on Whitebeard, Sand King as well as a level 7 or a level 8 on him, and the Skyrath gets level 6. Like, their lineup is extremely potent around the early part of the mid-game, but that early part of the mid-game for them is getting delayed by a couple of minutes because this early game didn't go the way they were hoping for, whereas for Cloud9, they have all their ultimates available, they're getting the better farm, and they have pretty good counterplay potential as well. It's not enough for Nyx to get the jump, they need to get it on their terms in addition to just getting a jump. Oh, wow, she gets caught out by the Fiend script. The arrow will be able to come in, and they can finish off at least this reincarnation from Ush. The Starstorm gets them. The slow goes off, double slow, pile I die. Oh, they're going to use the Moonlight Shadow just to make sure they get out successfully uh, at the chance that there is a Sand King rotation in as well. So at least they take away that reincarnation. That's going to be down for quite a long time now. What do you think about the, the uh, Wraith King's? item builds here. What does he go for? He's got a lot of gold he's holding on to due to the fact you've got two other melee initiators with Blink Dagger. Do you bypass Blink on your Wraith King? I would get Blink on him too. If nothing else, then he needs to get Blink to allow the others to get Blink. <laughs> because <laughs> okay. then he can set up the kills right now so the others can get some assist gold and get toward a Blink Dagger. Uh, just in addition to that, just having more means of initiating here is, is going to be really useful. As Fluff and stuff. Barely dodging yeah, that Yeah, that was, that was the level one nightmare right there. That was a level one nightmare coming into play. The nightmare wore off just Radiant's in time for the uh, speedy Skyrath mage to be able to get himself far enough away Dyer's from the Blink Dagger. Uh, speaking of that, well, Puck yeah. is able to pick up his. That's going to be the first Blink Dagger in the game, I believe. Yeah. So Fata, who got ganked in the mid lane and didn't, or yeah, he, he kind of died once, which he shouldn't have in this case, but he also had a little bit of an unfavorable lane. So getting a 12 minute Blink Dagger is perfectly fine for a Puck in this, in this case. And, well, what are we looking at for Nyx? I think, to me, it's going to be all-out aggression, honestly. Get the Blink Dagger on the Wraith King, get more and more Blinks, and just play full-out aggression. I think if you sit back and you farm, you're going to lose this game anyway to the Cloud9 lineup. Late game, Void almost has a battle fear in a 13-minute game here. They know it's coming as well. They've seen Eternal Envy's build up here. So, I think taking advantage of the fact that Void is going for a battle fear is, is going to be a really big uh, decision here for Nyx. Just try to play to your own strengths, and that is all those stuns and the silence from Skyrath just, be, they have to be hungry around the map here. Now, do you agree with that Battle Fury build? Uh, it's a build that we rarely see nowadays. Uh, seems Mask of Madness and Maelstrom being so prioritized that we rarely see the Battle Fury nowadays. Uh, do you think that Eternal Libby, just due to the fact that he's getting so much space, he's going to be able to make a good use of this farming item? I think it's, it's an item I would only consider valuable on a position one. Void, even if you're playing position three and getting decent farm, I still think it's, it's going to be too late and it doesn't make much sense if you have another position one. But when you're playing him in this position and you're getting a good start and it looks like the game 
Cloud9 can see the threat right here. Okay, if Sneak and Ix start playing extremely aggressively, we might have to slow down a little bit and go for the late game. That's perfectly fine to have a Battle Fury for the Look at the ultimates fly. TC's going to be taken out by inside the Chronosphere. Oh, what a beautiful dream call. Oh, the arrow! Too. It's snagged. Whitebeard. Ush is going to try and intercept as much of this as possible, but Fluff and Stuff is down. Whitebeard makes a Burrow Strike away. Ike Mike tries to come in, but the cast will be able to stop him. Not even Whitebeard's going to be able to make it out as his TP is canceled as he dies a very, very detestable death. Ush will be able to get himself away Radiant with the Blink Dagger at least, but Cloud9 for easy kills and now transitioning this Radiant into a quick tier one tower. It's looking like Cloud9 uh, are holding on to such a big lead. I'm not sure how Sneaky Nick's assassins are actually going to be able to take the mid game, which is what their lineup is all about. Yeah, it's, it's just the, the weak laning syndrome once again coming into play here. And this time around, it was just a great initiation from, from Cloud9. But the fact that they can pull this kind of team fight out in a 13-minute game is simply because it didn't go well enough for Nyx early on. And this time around, they're out of position. They get... You know, they could have caught their losses, right? They got Razor Chronoed with a Death Ward up. They could have been yep. like, okay, this guy's dead. Just get out. Instead, they stampede. They use the stampede from Centaur. And of course, that isn't going to help Razor for anything when he's stuck in time, right? And the others couldn't get into the fight because the Chrono was in a really good position. So essentially, they wasted stampede. And they had a four on five. And then they tried to fight. And that's just a recipe for disaster right here for, for Nick. So no big surprise to me that they get crushed in that fight. They just shouldn't have taken it at all. Well, it could be a recipe of uh, disaster here for Aoi. He's going to be picked off by Whitebeard's initiation. And Ix Mike with the double edge to finish him off. Still, don't look at the rotations in from Cloud9. They see these heroes deep inside their jungle, and they're going to punish them for it. Stampede goes out. Arrow catches Fluff and stuff, but they're going to try and actually return fire on the pylon die. Try to blow him up. The Skyrath Mage Ultimate will be enough. Now, Bone 7 makes a leap away, but it's an awkward one at that. Away. And three kills actually <laughs> picked up by Cloud9 in a return for just the one pickoff from Skyrath Mage. Well worth it for uh, Sneaky Nick's assassins. Yeah, if they get a tower too, this is a really big exchange. It seems to me like Sneaky Nick's assassins just need to get behind, and then they start making plays uh, that that favor them. It was the same in game number one. Oh, uh, mid lane though. In some trouble, gonna try and make the leap away. The Chronosphere will put a stop to that one. Whitebeard comes in, stops some of that damage. Still, TC will be falling to at least the Death Ward. And Whitebeard, well, he'll be able to get himself away, but unfortunately unable to save their mid razor. And it looks like at the pace this game is going, we will be definitely looking at, uh, unless if, if Cloud9 ends the game before that, we'll be looking at a 30 minute plus game. So. If you think into a late game situation, this kind of game, you've got a Wraith King who went Blink Dagger first, which I completely agree with in this situation. But that, of course, also means that his farming potential is not that high. It's going to take them a lot of time to get him online. And they're playing a Wraith King and a Razor as their carries against a Void and uh, a Marana, arguably. And then there's the X Factor, which is the Witch Doctor, who we haven't talked about his itemization much, but he's a thousand gold away from an Ag Scepter. And level 11 is also not far off from Aoi. Then he's going to have the highest damage output out of anyone in the game. And with his positioning so far, he just will have a really easy time getting off the Death Ward, I feel. He stands so far back, the other heroes force the fight to happen. And he's just going to come in. Whenever the Chrono comes off, he's going to silently drop that ward, and everyone's just going to disappear. Looks like a little bit of push here in this middle lane. will weaken up the tower a bit more, but... Cloud9 are not going to be giving up any free towers anytime soon. And, and going back to you talking about the build on the Wraith King and how the Blink Dagger generally will be slowing down your farm because you don't really have a farming item just yet, whether it's the Midas, whether it's obviously the, the Maelstrom is another great one. I'm concerned because Bone7, he's going to get his Maelstrom before the uh, the Wraith King at this point, which means this Marana is actually going to turn into quite the semi-carry at, at the very least. Feta. He's walking around right now with an invis rune. The arrow flies out, but unable to find the opening mark. Still, though, look at that net worth, though. 7,000 on the puck, 7,900 on the faces void. And meanwhile, sitting at a distant third and fourth, we have the Razor and the Wraith King at 6,200. Jump in, middle lane, Feta just poking and prodding, pushing out the lane. Oh, he's caught here. Oh, look at this white beard. He starts the epicenter, is going for it, blinking. Nice dodge with a face shift, but it's not going to be enough. Gets hit by the stun, and that will sh ensure his demise. 12 to 15, 18 minutes in, TC even finds a haste rune. And that's almost the axe for him. And now that now we're talking for Nyx. Now they're starting to get the items they need. Now they have two, they have three blink daggers. They almost have the axe on Razor. And they're starting to find just a few pickups, uh, pickoffs here and there, which are going to make a big difference. Now, as far as their itemization goes, they're still lacking damage for, like, physical damage for the mid-late game. But that's okay for now, because just the combination of spells and the heroes they have, 
if they find any sort of opening, it's a kill. Like, if they blink it with these three stuns and use Stampede, you need a Chronosphere to counter-initiate that. There's no other solution. So, uh, I would really like to see the, the Radiant side here trying to get more into the Dire Jungle. Uh, they they kind of have their own side of the map under control, but that's not good enough when you know Envy's running around with a Mask of Madness and Battle Fury. He will outfarm you. So they need to get more aggressive than they have so far. I believe they might have one or two smokes still available to them. Nope, never mind. I'm really bad at calling smokes today. They actually don't have any. Oh, man. So it's difficult. Cloven and Stuff is going to be able to find Veda here, unable to get out the silence in time, which means Veda is actually going to be able to get the kill as he orbs himself away to safety at the same time. And look at that. Eternal Empty has just farmed up a big old ancient stack on top of everything else. Yeah, he's getting so big. Now jumping into the Roche Pit, the immediate pings coming out here from, from Fluff and Stuff. They know that Roshan is a possibility here. Envy's going to start out. Let's see who's the better basher. It's one for one right now. Well, ah, he cheated. They got an arrow, but now it's not fun anymore. So this Roche will probably be contested by Nyx, but I don't know whether they can do it without the Epicenter, to be honest. It's still 30 seconds on cooldown. Cloud9's heroes are very well positioned here with the Marana and Bane on the high ground. And it looks like they're just going to concede this one to C9, and that's just another objective going their way, and they still haven't even lost a tower. Yeah, similar to game one. Nyx are not getting objectives at all. Due to their positioning, they will be able to get at least this middle tier one tower, but I, I feel like they kind of needed to claim a lot more map control in exchange for giving up that Roshan. Now, TC is still running in with the haste rune he's currently got. Finally, Roshan goes down. Immediately, he's just going to be picked up. Fiends grip onto TC, but beautiful stun from Whitebeard. And the follow-up two-man set from Ice Spike. But look at that! Owie just rips right through two of them. Now the third epicenter is not quite going out. Whitebeard will be stopped from that one as the cast hits him and the Chronosphere wiping out the other two. Nice blink away there from Ush, and it looks like he may be the only surviving member from that team fight oh, inside of Sneaky Nix <laughs> Assassins, and Bone7 had no idea where the Wraith King went. Still, though, a wonderful fight for Cloud9. They only lost one, which was the Bane. They also lost the Aegis on the side of Eternal Levy, but well worth it as they not only get the Roshan bounty, but four kills on top of it. That's just the Death Ward in action right oh, there with the Axe. That was incredible damage coming out from Maui. I don't think I've ever seen an arrow miss that much, though. Uh, that went for Bone 7. That was really far off, but of course, it was just like a gamble. They didn't know yeah. where he blinked to and ran. Yeah, he could either, either move left or move down and 50-50 yeah. shot, I guess. Still, right, so we're I looking at a 10,000 lead here for Cloud9, and it's, it doesn't help Nyx that I also, I also favor Cloud9's lineup in the late game. With the Witch Doctor with this much farm, it's kind of like having a third core, and you just know Aoi 2000 loves playing these supports where when you get to the mid and late game, you're not really a support anymore. You're actually another core. He loves the Visage for that reason. He also loves the Witch Doctor. I think there's a third oh, one that Veda. doesn't mind right now, but... Immediately gets countered here in the top lane. As he just blinked in, he's just like, oh, I'm just farming away, and all of a sudden, bam, instantly, Whitebeard. It's a great Burrow Strike, and I can say, like, Whitebeard, both him and Ush have really been impressing me on Sneaky Nick's Assassins in the last uh, month, month and a half. I think as a whole, the team has made so much improvements, and Ush and Whitebeard's performance have been, uh, I think, some of the most impressive improvements, uh, as, as Whitebeard is so damn good on those melee initiators, and you could see exactly why that last team fight was a beautiful burrow strike. It was really only upset by the fact that that Aghanim Switch Doctor Ultimate just destroyed everyone else. He's actually second highest on the net worth for his team. <laughs> Switch Look at this, jump in, Whitebeard will be able to get another two-man stand with another two-man stomp as well. And they wipe out both those heroes and Eternal Envy. He's got a battle here, he's got a Mask of Madness, but I don't think he's ready to take on the world just yet. Bottom tower is under attack. This is such a good gank for Nyx right here. Getting these two kills basically for free. Now they need to get out of there before they start getting some casualties themselves. The big ultimates are available for Cloud9. Ix Mike needs to blink really quickly. Oh, we'll get the out cast. For the first time here, but it's still going to be able to catch him out. Eternal Levy is going to be able to chase him down with the Mask of Madness, and they've hold Ix Mike in. They're actually saving him away from him. Oh no! Owie, he throws out the ultimate, but it wasn't close enough, and Mike just patiently waits out the dream so coil. So much mercy from Ii Sama right yeah. there. That was just way too much much mercy. Actually, from the whole team, kind of going for a pacifist style after that Dream Coil. I mean, definitely worth it just to throw down the Chronosphere for, for a Centaur. They were Kill worried Ray. about the counter-initiation from yeah. the Sand King with Epi. It makes a lot of sense, but when when we can see the whole map, it kind of looks ridiculous how there are three <laughs> heroes running away from one guy with one-third health, but mm -hmm. playing it safe here, being a little bit careful and not throwing away their lead, because you see on these graphs, that's two successful ganks. It was one kill, and then it was two kills. Especially the experience just... They pulled back about 5,000 with those two ganks. So Cloud9 don't want to make too many mistakes here. And, well, if they do get out at the very least.
Yeah, and then Sneaky Nick's Assassins have already shown the propensity to be able to find those openings. Uh, that's that's two different team fights with beautiful initiations from both Ix Mike as well as Whitebeard that we were able to get them two very quick pickoffs like that. Um, Cloud9 have to know they're a very experienced team. They know that those kills are more significant than they once were thanks to the high amount of net worth lead that they're currently holding on to. Now, uh, Ix Mike is actually uh, about to pick up a very big item here, the four staff for himself. If that extra mobility needs a lot for a centaur. Yeah, it's gonna it's gonna allow him to get in and get out. That's kind of been the problem so far is that when they start Oh, he's gonna stampede into an arrow, but oh, good God. Job from from Fluff here. Yeah, okay. they're still gonna be able to finish him off. Whitebeard hits the stun and with the ultimate going off from Fluff and stuff, they easily secure that kill Ike Mike though. I've gotta uh, say Cloud9 are a little bit sloppy to be honest in the movement around the map. I think this kind of uh, they're giving away a lot of kills here to, to Nyx. It's of course also Nyx seizing the opportunities here, but Cloud9 have been giving a lot of space here, and I think should they advance out of the series as the victors, of course they are the, the big favorites here. They, they're going to need to step up their their map awareness against uh, some of the some of the teams we've seen earlier today. This kind of uh, of map movement and map positioning is just not it's not enough against right. the best we've seen in this tournament so far. So. They need to uh, to pull themselves together here. They're giving away a lot of golden experience, this Radiant side. By all means, they're still ahead, but it's just too sloppy, and we expect more from Cloud9. Now, during this pause, let's go ahead and take a, a chance to be able to talk about some items coming up. Uh, uh, the first one that really flags for me, Ush. He's sitting with the Maelstrom. He's got 2,100 gold. Do you go in this game... For the BKB, knowing that there is a decent amount of disables, a decent amount of magic damage, but there's also a lot of physical damage as well. Do you just embrace the the fact that you're probably going to be dying very quickly in these team fights? Don't worry about a BKB. Embrace the disables. Embrace the fact that you're going to be dying very quickly and try and output as much damage during the limited time you have with going like a straight Mjolnir build. Like all out damage. As much damage as you can get. I like the Mjolnir a lot here. I Generally, if you look at the dire lineup, a BKB is pretty amazing, but mm -hmm. there's still Chronosphere and there's still Fiend's Grip, and I think he will be getting controlled, and even with a BKB, the physical damage is just way too much. The Death Ward's just going to shred him. He's got six armor. He's just going to disappear in these fights. Uh-oh, bottom lane. Armor, so. Oh, he's going to be picked off here as the smoke rotation finds him, and another kill for Fluff and stuff, who gets a dominating streak gold off of that one. BKB now picked up by Eternal Envy, though, and that one's going to hurt quite a bit as they've been relying so heavily on their magic damage, they're really not ready to output enough physical damage to threaten this Faces Void. I mean, it's, it's, again, it's just another pickup here for uh, for Nyx. They get another free kill. And if you if you bring up the gold graph, not to look at the graphs themselves, but just to look at the green dots at the bottom, you can just see across the last five minutes or over the last five minutes, there's been like pick off, pick off, pick off. Got a little bit of a trade off and then pick off again and again. And Cloud9 is just giving a lot of freebies here, and it's basically what's keeping Nyx in the game is that they're playing aggressively exactly like they should. But Cloud9 are not moving as a group until now. This is when they're going to try to go for a three-man gank. If they find these two heroes out, they're just completely gone. Envy Smoke is going to break. They know what's up here. TC is going to be found inside the jungle. Chronosphere goes up. Eternal Envy has to work his way through the trees first. Nice. Fiend's Grip goes down in order to stop Fluff and stuff. And TC, while he is very, very tanky, he's eventually going to be surrounded here and taken down. Farther up, we do have Fluff and stuff, who even going down from Aoi's ultimate there, gets dropped just to ensure there's no chance of the Skyrath Mage getting out. Ush will try to get out here. He actually blinked into the trees, so if they shoot an arrow now, they could get this kill probably if with another TP support, but Bone7 has no idea. He's actually going to get intimidated out by Ix Mike, and he will be backing off, but... Yeah, even popping Whoa there. Finally, Cloud9 going a little bit on the aggressive with their heroes here and combining their forces instead of just getting picked off left and right. And You see, the moment they're combining their heroes, their team fight is just so incredibly powerful that I think any sort of 5-on-5 five five without Epicenter is a, lose for, is a loss for Nyx. They cannot win a fight like that. So if Cloud9 can find him and initiate the fight by taking out the Sand King, I think they're going to just ro roll over the fight. So White, There's a lot of pressure on Whitebeard, but he's uh, like you said, he's been performing really well for Nyx. Uh, Pretty much my my standout player for uh, for Sneaky Nicks and the in the TI4 qualifiers, with especially his disruptor plays, he's really good at, at playing from a distance. So Sand King also a hero that really suits him well. 
Right, and I feel like uh, you were talking about how Cloud9 grouping up a little bit more. I think another important thing is Sneaky Nick's assassins can't really abuse the fact that Cloud9, when they group up like that, you, normally there's opportunities to try and draw out the game by split pushing, maybe take some towers, but it, it's really just not there for Sneaky Nick's assassins. They don't have a whole lot of pushing power, and it's mainly on just this Razor with the Aghanim's upgrade um, with the Eye of the Storm. But that's really not enough to threaten towers, I feel. Most of the time, the rest of these heroes just aren't very strong at being able to output enough physical damage in time. And the very, very limited amount of time you're going to have for split pushing. Now, the one thing they do have in that regard is, of course, the Mjolnir picked up by Yosh. So pushing out the creep waves is going to be really quickly, uh, really quick for them. But like you said, damage on towers, they just don't really have it yet apart from the axe. So yeah. Especially I also with don't know like how big of an issue that is right now, but it will be a problem soon if they don't manage to get a little more out of control. But they've recovered nicely already. See in the bottom lane, once again, Ush goes for the push out. He's almost level 16 though, and that's uh, obviously a big upgrade, being able to have that reincarnation. Pretty much every single team fight is incredibly important. And you can see the rest of Sneaky Nick's assassins just playing this very defensively, always making sure that the heroes that are farming have some sort of backup. Yeah, Arrow. I think there was a little bit of a fish here from Bone7. Doesn't find anyone, though, but... It's slowing down a little bit here. I would still say this easily favors Cloud9, who still have the better map control and probably the better late game, too, but... I still have a lot of hope for Nyx to, to find one or two good team fights, and should they do so, I think they're... Again, it's, it's kind of like Game 1. They're going to be completely back in the game, just that this time around they are at less of a deficit, but arguably also have worse late game, so perhaps a comparable scenario in that regard. Still, how are they going to deal with the Void is going to be my question. Do they have anything to stop him in the, in the BKB right now? The answer is no uh, <laughs> to that right now. <laughs> but later on, who's going to deal the damage? Like, Razor has good damage with the Axe, but it's, it's uncontrollable who you, direct, who you hit with it directly. And the Wraith King is a melee core against Void that just has a tendency to not work unless we're talking generally only PA seems to do well against Void. Yeah, I mean, there is the upside that Wraith King as a core is nice to be able to have on the front lines because if he's the one who gets chronosphered, well, it's fine. You're trading an ultimate for an ultimate, uh, essentially. The reincarnation given away in exchange for the chronosphere. Uh, but other than that, I, I think you're right. It's mainly about what the ultimate is going to set up for the side of the Faceless Void and, and how that is going to allow Pylai die, or rather, sorry, that's actually uh, Aoi 2000, who's going to be able to drop that ultimate. And just one hero's all it takes with the bounce. Skyrath Mage is going to be picked off here as the arrow lands on him, and Fluff and stuff will be taken out. They're actually searching for more as Cloud9 quickly move out and look for other pickoffs, but they're not going to be finding anything. In fact, Fade is going to head up yep, to the top will. lane. Oh, oh no. Oh, they whiffed it. Dream Coil completely whiffing there. Whitebeard is still going to be able to blink himself away in this bottom lane. And back up to top where Ike's Mike may be sticking around here, knowing that he's got some backup. But I'm not sure how wise it is to try and force some team fights at this point, especially with the possibilities of knowing that uh, the rest of Cloud9 could teleport in to respond. Now they jump in. Beta will still be able to get a jump away. The ultimate going out from Aoi 2000. Us just embraces it, runs right into that support. It's going to be trying to go for the kill, but he's too damn tanky. He can't actually output enough damage. Damage. The reincarnation will slow everyone down there. The sleep goes off on TC. Nice blink away from the Wraith King. And they're going to try and make sure that TC gets out successfully. Retreating as a whole to make sure that no one hero gets picked off. Now Cloud9 may actually continue to go for it. Ice Mike whiffing the hook stomp there. Going to go for Pylai Dive, but the cast starts bouncing around. Ush is going to be held into place. The Skyrath Mage Ultimate is going to be able to finish off Pylai Dive. And now the stun onto Beta, who's been silenced up. Nice Yule Scepter usage. Will be able to save him for a point in time. TC looking for that Plasmic Field. Unable to get Beta. And now he's going to be going down to Eternal Envy with the Chronosphere locking in two. Goes for a second one in Whitebeard and will be able to claim it as well. Three kills in exchange for just the one, and it's just a Bane support, too. That's the worst part of all. Man, Owie is just so far. <laughs> I'm going to keep returning to this. You saw the Wraith King trying to bring him down one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. Owie has 12 armor and 1,700 health on a support. Whoa, He's got his BKB in the base. And that's that's a pretty big deal, because that's one thing we haven't talked about for Nyx yet. They don't have a BKB counter. Right. This ultimate will be channeled full duration because they can't kill him, as you saw right then. They don't have the physical damage, and they're going to have no lockdown. Aoi is going to be absolutely out of control, almost level 16 now as well. Any sort of just decent chrono out of Envy is just a flat-out one fight if they get the ward out. 
that's how crazy Owie is right now. In addition to that, you've got plenty of farm on the other heroes as well, apart from the Bane. They've really sacrificed Pilot Eye a lot in this game, who's very low on net worth. But it's just allowed Owie to get so much farm on the Witch Doctor that I think, you know, if you compare this right now, their, their net worth combined is like about 14,000, of which 10,000 are on, are on Owie. If they would have split that evenly, it would have been way less useful. I think this is a great distribution in the right call in this game. Yeah, and look at that. Uh, Roshan currently being done by Cloud9. We do have Sneaky Nyx assassins who are going to try and formulate some sort of response. Uh, she's going to jump right in, go straight for Eternal Envy, and is outputting a lot of good damage. But now with the BKB going up, he's going to lose his first life. Fiend's Grip onto TC. Eternal Envy will add his damage to that one as well. Gets one, now going for two. Whitebeard comes in with the Epicenter, but unable to get much there as Bone 7 makes the leap away. They get at least the Bane. Fata will also fall as he gets hit by the stun from Ush. And they're looking to be able to control this Roshan pit a little bit longer, but it's three versus three. They know all the ultimates are down from the side of Cloud9, but does that really give them the opportunity to jump in? Whitebeard, oh, unable to get it once again as Bone7 is able to make his leap away. And now the return fire. They're going to try and output a little bit of damage here and there. Ush searching for his opening, but Cloud9 are just making sure there's no chance that SNA feel comfortable enough to be able to steal Roshan away from them. We and found the counter to Aoi as well, by the way. Mm -hmm. He got bashed by Rosh when he was channeling Death Ward. <laughs> that's one thing that goes through BKV right there. So All right, so just uh, enlist, Roshan. enlist Roshan into your side <laughs> and you're good. Yeah. Well, that was kind of an underwhelming Death Ward, too. I think they already had that kill on the on the first Wraith King. Uh, or, yeah, the first Wraith King kill, I believe that was. So, But Dying yeah, that, that just goes to show how important it is to get a good Death Ward off, because Dying even though Cloud9 got off to a pretty good start attack. there, they after the Chronosphere is down, when the Death Ward is down, their damage isn't that high, and it's pretty unreliable. Envy can't really run into this team with so many stuns and, and the silence without his BKB available and without the Chrono. So I think Cloud9 are going to be pretty happy with a 2 for 2 here, but they need to not concede the Roshan. That would be a really big mistake, and I, I don't think they will here. They actually... They're gonna, they have the Chrono again here. The orb. Oh, this is going to be a disaster if they oh, stick around. Oh, no. Uh, she's going to be grabbed here. He's got the Reincarnation up, and that's why Eternal Envy goes straight for TC. And if he can take him out, this will be a huge win for them. The Ice Drum goes out, but it's too late. Eternal Envy has more than enough physical damage. Now the ultimate from Owie with the Fiend's Grip as well. Ike's mic is down. Ush looking for an opportunity, but the Moonlight Shadow completely protects Owie, and he's going to be able to get that additional kill to jump away from Whitebeard. But they're going to find Fluff and Stuff instead. Gets a couple of right clicks. Jump in, Eternal Envy. Nice turnaround as they're able to pop at least one for this terrible, terrible team fight. Whitebeard trying to make his leap away. Ike's Mike gets the hoof stomp, buys some time for his ally. But Fluff and Stuff gets taken out by Veda, chasing Ike's Mike away. He's looking for that opening, just needs a blink dagger. Three seconds is all he needs, and he might be able to get enough distance. And it looks like he's got the opportunity. Veda sees him, though, and now he's going to be able to chase further. Yule Scepter is coming up soon, and he will be able to delay Ike's Mike's jump away. Or with the cast bouncing around, Ike's Mike four staffs himself away. He's a big tanky guy, but can't really tank all of this. 200 health left. Veda should be able to catch up soon. Ike's Mike just looking to be able to hit the hoof stomp off a of blink dagger. That's the only way he would have survived. Whitebeard gets off the epicenter here, but look how tanky these guys are, man. Veda as well as Aoi, two of the heroes that should be the squishiest on the side of Cloud Nine are sitting at 1500 health and 1800 health respectively. There's no way an epicenter by itself is able to clean those guys up. This puck is really high level. He's level 20. So that's where a lot of that tankiness comes from. A lot of points in attribute bonus already. He's got five in that. And of course, the Lincoln Sphere. He's going to be almost impossible to bring down for the Radiant side now as well. And Cloud9 just has so much freedom in these fights now to play them like they want. The only risk is what happened right there is when Envy's BKB is over and they catch him off guard, he's just going to get burst down immediately. But during the Chronosphere, I think the fight is, is borderline impossible to win for Nyx. So what they have to try to do is either catch Envy off guard and burst him down completely, or try to bait out a BKB and a, a half a half bad, if not a really bad Chrono, and then they need to turn around based on that. But any fight with a good Chrono is a loss. He's able to find Ush here, is going to be dropping the ultimate, just trying to buy time. Bone 7 throws out the arrow, unable to get it. And Ush will now turn and fight Feta as much as he can. But, of course, with that Lincolns as well as the phase shift, there's just not possible for the Wraith King to lock him down long enough to get a kill. He's going to continue his farming here with the... Now uh, 9 second BKB, so still plenty of time left on that for Ush, and he will need a damage item right now. There's kind of no discussion. I think an aura of some sort will definitely not be good enough. He needs to hit hard himself. Uh, the question is, what's the best choice then? If he just goes into a Desolator or something like an MKB? Dare I say it, Sandarin? 
what what Ep- about abyssal blade? <laughs> what about an abyssal blade? I mean, hey, That's it gives you too. extra lockdown. Uh, uh, this guy is swinging fast. Maybe oh, top lane oh. envy. Envy kind of caught out here. Yule Scepter will be able to save Eternal Envy. He easily can get off the BKB now, but they're going to continue to go in. Chronosphere locking down Ice oh, Mike. No. Oh no, Wash! He jumps in. White Bear comes in as well with the epicenter, but still not enough to finish off Eternal Envy. And he's got the Ages as well, able to mimic the Wraith King with his reincarnation. Now, Ush's second life is going to be going out. It's a free script. Holds him in. TC going to be pursued out as well. Spada ultimate in with the Yule Scepter. The rest of Cloud9 will surround him. And is the arrow land. It spells the death toll for not only the Razor, but potentially for the rest of SNAs. Now they're going to be losing a lot of map control here. Tier 2 tower goes down, and looks like Cloud9, they're not stopping yet. Yeah, they forced out. They won that fight 4-0, to zero and they forced Radiant's out the Sand King buyback. And they have to know Epicenter is still available, but if they're all in full health, they won't be dying to this anyway. The Witch Doctor heal is activated. They all have like 2,000 health apart from Bone7, who does have a BKB, however, so he's going to be fine. There is absolutely no stopping this siege from Cloud9. This is going to easily be one lane of barracks. I think they might... Oh, they can't go oh, for a second the epicenter one. going off. He's going to go for both. Seven BK can be activated, so instead he jumps for Eternal Envy. But it's still not enough. They needed the double ultimates to be able to claim one kill. And unfortunately, this Skyrath Mage dropping it on a Bone 7, who is fast enough to get his BKB off. And meaning... This, t- this set of racks is definitely Radiant's done for. And Cloud9 could even potentially move this Radiant's into the middle lane and try and go for attack. a tier two, or maybe even just go for more here. Eternal Envy. Oh, the host stomp goes off from IX Mike just in time to stop Eternal Envy, who is threatening a Chronosphere there as he was in Viz. Teleport in. Ush, he's going to look for a kill here. Gets the stun onto Bone 7. The follow up Bro Strike should be able to ensure this kill. Bone 7, leap away, not up. Not up for another 10 seconds, and it looks like we now have a Blink Dagger here for our Witch Doctor. Man, this guy is farmed. Yeah, he's fourth on the farm for his team now, though. He, he's actually back to the position four he was drafted for. Eh, he was kind of a position two earlier on, but mm-hmm. he's found the right place here, and he has everything he needs for the rest of the game. This is pretty much generally the fullest inventory you'll see a witch doctor have in a competitive game so and it's in a 40 minute game as well this is still a fine inventory to have 10 minutes later even 20 depending on the game this is perfectly fine uh, so always definitely way way on the right path here oh and that's that's an interesting pickup that uh, some people have been talking about the upgraded to the agony scepter for the puck possibly making it uh, more viable than it once was still those sneaky nicks assassins will be able to claim a tower here but at what cost here we right now we see cloud nine are going to be looping around with their smoke looking for an opening 40 minutes into this game if they can get a good enough team fight they could potentially just barrel roll through the middle lane and finish this off a turn be running around with his mask man is searching for somebody they're gonna see fluff and stuff yule scepter going off but it looks like it's still going to be killed stampede maybe they can't jump this oh no eternal heavy gets off the chronosphere on both and without we dropping the ultimate there this is going to be a disaster tc forced away by eternal heavy Ush can't even get the kill on pilot i die as he falls tc goes down as well Ush with his second life trying to claim anything anything he will be able to get no pilot die oh. moonlight shadow saves him he gets the zap at least and at least they have some something to hold on to. They got one in exchange for their five, Cinderin. Cloud9, yeah, Cloud, though. Cloud9 will be getting another lane of barracks here, yeah. I think. It's it's 70 seconds on Sand King and Wraith King. No buybacks on them. There's actually not a single buyback on the entire Radiant side, so... Are they just going for Tier 4s here? Tier 2s are still up. Uh, they can go to the bottom lane, actually. That Tier 2 is down if they wanted to, but... <laughs> I mean, that goes to show just how in control of this game they are. That they just meander into the enemy base. They're not really worried about any potential buybacks whatsoever. The secret is, there's none on SNA. Yeah, this bottom tier 3 is definitely going to go down. This this is the second lane of barracks and pretty much pretty much the end of the game here unless they can pull off some sort of miracle fight. But the, the deficit's just too big now. We're looking at past the 25,000 and 30,000 on gold next period, uh, respectively. And yeah, this... It's it's just over. They once again, it's it's interesting to, interesting to see the way Nyx plays these games, where their laning phase definitely needs a lot of work. Then they have some pretty good mid game movement and they get some nice ganks off, but it's just never enough to bring them back on even footing. And then eventually they lose one or two big team fights. It was the exact same story in game number one. It's it's a totally different draft, but I feel like it's the same thing that happened in both games. And Cloud Niners is just. They're outplaying them in two stages of the game, the laning phase and the later portion of the mid game. And yeah, it's just, yeah, you, you can't really come back from this now if, if you're Nyx. They're going for the last desperation smoke here, very classic play. Uh, Fluff and stuff kind of uh, loved going for these when they were playing as complexity. 
And unfortunately, it's gonna be ruined here. The smoke goes up. Oh, nice. Both seven gets off the BKB. Ike's Mike getting bashed to death by Eternal Envy, who's now gonna be jumping in further. Gets TC inside the Chronosphere. Witch Doctor Ultimate also going off, and it's now bouncing over to Hush, who's fighting up against the world right now. Epicenter coming in. Will be able to lock down both seven, do a lot of damage to all these heroes, but it's just not enough. Now Fiend's Grip onto Ush, and it's looking like this is the end of the dream for Sneaky Nick's Assassins are going to be losing this game, too, as they call the GG. And Cloud9 will be setting their date for the semifinals tomorrow. Yeah, really good, uh, really good ending to the game here from Cloud9. I think overall, Cloud9's biggest strengths going, going in tomorrow is that they've definitely got their lane play under control. I think their lane play in both games was really good for, like, all of their solos did what they had to do in the lanes. They, they got off to a great start. The earlier portion of the mid game looking quite a bit shaky, and I think they're going to have. They're playing against Evil Geniuses tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So. it's Secret versus VG Gaming, and Evil yeah. Geniuses versus Cloud9. And against Evil Geniuses, these these kind of uh, kind of sloppy mistakes they make in the earlier portion of the mid game, they have to they have to clear those out because they're going to yes. cost even more. Because I don't think you can expect to win the laning stage like this against EG. If they do, it's really impressive if they do that and. Well, yeah, we'll have to see if, if they can manage to do that tomorrow. All right, guys. Well, let's we'll see what our experts think about Cloud9's play as we're going to hand it off to them now. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to all of our commentary team today for the uh, great job that they've done throughout a very long day. We're in hour 19 uh, today, incredibly. It's been a very, very long day, but very enjoyable Dota. Um, we're just going to get the final thoughts of our four members on the uh, analysis desk here, thanks to uh, T-Mobile. And, and what is it that stands out for you today, Malk? What do you remember most? I mean, it's been a long day, right? So you have to remember a long way back here. You have to use those great too, too long. Uh, I, I, I got to go with Team Secret's uh, yeah. stable play. I mean, I think they were probably the most convincing. Yeah. But in general, I, the very shifting picks probably stood out to me. Mm. And and then the fact that Aoi just snuck in uh, and I got him set on the witch doctor this game. Yep. Caught me completely off guard. I thought I was so tired that I was <laughs> seeing double when that 20 minutes <laughs> exactly which start does like, came off. I was like, "Where's oh, the dancing? Wow, I really need to go home and sleep now." <laughs> uh, what about Alliance CG? Was that uh, was that a standout standout game? I think it was probably the best game of the oh, day. Oh yeah, yeah oh, obviously those yeah. games were were beautiful. Yeah, that Very was expected though. I suppose. I guess Team Secret was kind of expected too. But I knew Alliance CG was going to go long. But yeah, I've seen some crazy comebacks in 6.8 too. But those were the craziest. Hmm. Okay, Pirim, yes. your, your highlight of the day? Um, it's home time. Okay. My highlight of the day. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm just kidding. I think uh, every series has been different, which yeah. is good. Yeah, it very hasn't different. been very similar styles. And I like the fact that all the matchups, some of them have been maybe slightly easier than others, but even in that matchup, the Dota has been interesting. Interesting heroes, interesting picks. So, okay. yeah, I... I Really looking forward to tomorrow. I think we can have some great series. And yeah, tomorrow, of course. Very uh, close. C9 EG and Secret versus VG. It's going to be a, a, a great day. Two fantastic semifinals. What have you, what have you loved about today? Mm, all the games, uh, as we said, I mean, really balanced games, uh, different play styles, yeah. many heroes picked. I really liked it. I still think that, honestly, EG and uh, Secret are a bit better than the other teams in this okay. tournament, in my opinion. Like, the, the last quarterfinal was... Um, in terms of level of play, I think way behind the others. That's what I think. But I'm really looking forward to see those teams perform yeah. tomorrow. Okay. Thank you very much, gents. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow, of course, from the Team Mobile Desk once more to bring you analysis, breakdown, and some more giraffe jokes. We'll be back tomorrow, as I said already. Let's head back to the stage now to close out the show and get a final interview with DJ Wee. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, guys. I'm here with Eternal Envy from Cloud9. Big round of applause for these guys. Last team to move on to day two. Now, Eternal Envy, let me ask you a quick question. I was hearing some rumors, some talks, some discussion that you guys weren't totally confident coming into this game. Is this true? No. I was no. sleepy, though. <laughs> sleepy, sleepy. Okay, so... You, you wake up right before the match. And get done what you need to get done. Well, then let's talk about game two. Um, I mean, game one, everything seemed to go as planned. Game two, it, building off of game one, everything seemed to go perfect. Bone seven hit like four out of four arrows right away. He was firing blind arrows like crazy, hitting all of them. Uh, Fata had 11 minute blink. Uh, Owie had a 19 minute Oggs on, um, uh, on Witch Doctor. Like, Everything seemed to go right in this game. No. No, I don't, that's not. I see. I think the first game we almost threw, 
And then the second game, like, AUI got like a 17 minute agonums. He played super well, then he started throwing. Like, uh, then like, AUI died one time, and then like, Potom Bane died, and I fucked up, or like, I don't know. So I, I, I mean, you feel you are, uh, you've always been a player that said, I feel like we could have played better. Despite your performance, you, you're, you're walking away from the stage with day two thinking there are areas that we can improve. I don't feel like we played well enough to win this tournament. So is tomorrow a new day? Yeah. yeah. Revenge was for EG. What's that? Revenge was EG and uh, Lan. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, Eternal Envy, we'll see you tomorrow. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, thanks for joining us for day number one here of ESL New York at Madison Square Garden Theater. We will see you bright and early tomorrow morning for our two semifinals and our grand finals where over $100,000 will be given away. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you tomorrow.